الحمد لله السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته الحمد لله it's lovely to see all of you um, I know we're almost at the end but Jamal Mubarak to inshallah all of you I want to thank uh, first and foremost MCC brother Munir the whole team here and sister Sara Suleimani who mashallah is the one who spearheaded this program tonight let's give them all a round of applause alhamdulillah alhamdulillah it's really critical information that was just shared. I'm sure all of you agree after watching this film. How many of you, this was the first time you've ever seen this film? Okay, subhanAllah. Again, Jazakallah khairan sara for thinking about this. We, we first previewed it, how many years ago? Four, five years ago. When it first came out, we screened it here. And alhamdulillah, we had, I'm sure, um, other families with teenagers similar to the ages that I see here come out for that screening. Uh, and I know that it was showing in some of the other local masajid. And back then, you know, this was something that all of us, especially as educators and parents, really felt was so critical. And five years later, post-COVID, when things have exacerbated so much more, right, especially with our dependence on screens, it's even more critical that we have these conversations. So I'm really proud of all of you th for the parents that I see here, Jazakumullah khairan, as well as the youth for making this a priority. Because on a Friday night, we know you could be every anywhere, right? Uh, it's summer break, right? How many of you are done with your school? Alhamdulillah, Mubarak. <laughs> I remember how exciting summer break was. Uh, so you could be anywhere, but you chose to come here, and that's obviously um, you know, a sign that you see how vital and critical this conversation is. And that's why we wanted to provide an opportunity for parents and youth to hear from each other. As someone who's kind of caught between these two groups, I often hear from both sides, but obviously different viewpoints, different perspectives. And I think it's always such a blessing when we can come together in a shared space and actually listen to each other. So for this portion of tonight's program, what I'd really like to do is facilitate a conversation. And what I'm gonna ask is that we all have opened minds um, you know, Sayyidina Ali, he, he has a, many beautiful quotes, but one of his quotes that always I remember as a, as a parent and as a teacher is where he instructs parents, he says, do not raise your children the way you were raised because they come from a different generation. This is a great hikmah. Right, that we have generational differences. And those of us who are in the uh, Gen X, uh, millennial or even I don't know if there are any boomers in here are there boomers I don't think I don't think anybody wants to admit to that category but maybe maybe there are some boomers here um, we all were remember a time without social media without the internet without devices so for our lens when we see our children constantly yearning s for screens asking for screens bargaining for screens fighting crying over phones and devices and television and video games. It's such an alien world for us and we feel that there is some sort of capture of the mind happening, right? So it's out of concern that a lot of parents you know, push back. But sometimes that doesn't register with the youth that this is their world, right? They have literally in many cases, how many of you remember playing with an iPad, maybe we can just get some perspective here for the youth here. How many of you remember playing with an iPad or uh, a phone in your hand, an iPod, whatever, device, remote control, something gadgety, as young as maybe two, three, four years old, right? How many? Raise your hand so we can see them. That your parents would let you, and it's okay, there's no shame, there's no judgment, right? We're not here to judge people. We're just saying that for many people in the room, they were almost, you know, came into the world and there was a phone in front of them, a device in front of them. So this is not alien to their worldview. And then when they go out into the schools, right? For those of you, how many of you are public school students? Okay, so let's just, yeah, let's, let's just do some, you know, real talk here. How many of you public school students see phones out constantly in your school environment, in the classrooms, right? So our, a lot of our public schools, they don't have the rules, right? In private schools and other more controlled environments, you can uh, prohibit certain things. But in a lot of public schools, as far as I know, they don't. So in the classroom, this is obviously a, a difficult challenge for teachers because uh, as we saw in the film, right? When that one teacher called out the student who, who was playing what? What was he doing during class? 
He was playing a game. And what, did, what was the reason why he said he was playing the game? Exactly. One is here. It's, it's easy. It's convenient. It's right here. Um, you know. And remember, I mean, I don't know. I, I um, I remember vaguely, but I think they went into some of the physiology, you know, the structure of the brain, the the, uh, the pleasure center of the brain, and how these devices are constantly tapping into that, right? And so it's it's actually quite normal if you think of it from the adult perspective that a child that has something in their hand that's constantly you know, igniting a part of their brain that makes them feel good is going to want to keep doing that activity, and that's where we have to obviously impose some rules. But my point here is that they have unrestricted access to these devices in places where they are spending a great majority of their time in many cases. And what I mean by unrestricted, I've seen it, where even if a, a student doesn't have their own phone, their friends likely have a phone, right? And their friends are likely showing them content through their phone. So there's constant interface with this, these devices. And then they come home, and if we're being honest with ourselves as parents, my kids will be the first to tell you, I am on a computer or on the phone almost throughout the day. And sometimes they will come and shame me, and be like, ooh, mommy, screen at a time, wow. 11 hours, 12 hours. So we can't be hypocritical. We are spending a lot of time. These devices are part of our lives, and we just have to have that out of the way, because then the next question is, well, then how do we provide balance? Because by the end of the film, what did we, what was the conversation, right? The students who were lined up, they were playing at the park, and they were asked, like, are you happy that your parents are, you know, a little strict? What was their answer? Yes. yes. How many of you, when you have a day where you're with your friends, whether it's going to the park or you know whatever at a at some social event, going to uh, Marine World, I mean a uh, Great Great America or some other theme park maybe or so anything that's fun, the mall, wherever you go to go eat, and you come home, do you feel like you missed out when when you were with your friends? No, you actually enjoy that time more, and that's really the heart of. Um, what our faith teaches us, right, that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala created us to be social beings. We're actually brought together in this world. We're not all isolated. We're not all individualized to the point where we, we don't even see each other. We don't have relationships. We have relationships because we're supposed to be connecting with each other. So the irony of social media and, and devices is that although it's called you know social networking or that that's the purpose of them, they have actually cause so much harm in our personal relationships, right? We're not connecting the, as much as we are. And when we do connect, we don't feel like we missed out. That, that was the point. That when we're actually connecting with each other, when we're spending time with our friends, going out, having fun, that's always more, um, more precious time spent than being alone in your room or, or you know, wherever you are in some corner on a phone. So this is really what, what we want to focus on, is that you know, there's something uh, that Aristotle and some of the great philosophers introduced about knowing the difference between apparent goods right, and real goods. What, is, what does the word apparent mean? Not a parent, but apparent. Who knows their, their vocabulary? If something is apparent, what does it mean? Yes? Very good. Visible, easy to see, something obvious, right? So there are things that are obvious goods, and then there are things, or they appear to be, we should say. They appear to be good, and then there are things that are real goods. We're living in a time where these things are confused. I mean, they're, they're kind of, you know, the, people don't have the discernment. They, they kind of get confused about what's a real good and what's not. Because when you look at the devices like that girl, right? What did, I think her name is Tessa, right? Was, her, was that the daughter's name? Yeah. When Tessa got her iPhone, how did she react? right she just was like so excited and it's true I mean I think I've had that reaction <laughs> when I got my first uh, like smartphone I remember it was an exciting moment because you look at this thing and it's like wow all the things I can do on this compu little computer and for those of us who remember again a time where you had to go and log into this big massive screen all right there's a lot of talking going on over here you guys that's very distracting thank you so um I remember when you had to you know, log on to a big computer, and here you have a computer in your hand. So it was exciting. I mean, we have to be honest that technology is exciting. So it seems like it's such a great thing. But then when you start to follow the trajectory, follow the, the research, and you start to see our world since these devices, we now begin to understand that it appeared to be really good. 
right? And not to say that there isn't good. I mean, again, we benefit from them, and we have to be people who can acknowledge the blessings of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He's given us these abilities as human beings to do extraordinary things, and among that is producing technology, but we have to use everything with wisdom. So it appears to be this great thing, but then again, we're noticing without control, without some sort of you know boundaries, the whatever appears to be good can actually turn into something really negative and destructive. And that's why a film like this is so important because it reminds us not to ever give any uh, sort of sense of our, our, our control to anybody or to anything, right? And that's what these devices have, have done to many people, adults and children alike. They've, in a way, hijacked the mind of the human being, where we are controlled by them, we, uh, we, we reach for them, you know, like that girl who was saying that, what did she say? I think she said that the reason why she really likes her phone is because when she's in social settings, what does it do? What can she do with the phone? Exactly, being distracted during awkward situations. So it creates a barrier, right? So you take out the phone and now I can use this as a barrier. A barrier to what? To human connection. If you do that over time, it makes it very difficult to talk to people. You start to get anxiety over the littlest human interactions like asking for a cup of water at a restaurant, right? And that's if you feel uh, anxious doing something like that, it's likely because maybe you don't have enough practice doing that. And if, if the, the phone is, is one of the reasons, then you need to see it for what it is, that it's become now a barrier. But there's much more, right? The, the worlds, the portals that it can lead us to. And that's where social media comes in. Because it's one thing to have a phone and to play games or to kind of, you know, there are people who do Sudoku, they do puzzles, they're doing all these other things. They're using it as an instrument that's useful to them. That's, uh, that's different than someone who's going into the rabbit's hole of social media. Right, so social media is a place, and you know, as some of you may know, I've talked extensively about the harms of social media. I've warned people. I myself, uh, in the past, maybe seven months or eight months, even longer, perhaps, since uh, since the situation in Gaza. May Allah subhanahu wa taala bring uh, peace uh, and and uh, free the people of Gaza, inshallah, from from their oppressors. But since that um, event, uh, I, I just have completely. Uh, gone off. I, I don't really have any desire to be on there. I mean, I'm on there to, you know, check messages because I get messages, but to actually use it, I see the exploitation of these mediums and how they really are misused in many ways. And then when we see young youth on there, I mean, this is where so much of, of what is put out there, the algorithms, do you guys know what an algorithm is? It? What is an algorithm? What's an algorithm? Yes. Go ahead. Good, it's, it's in a way, yes. So it's, a, it's like a computer code or language, right, that is designed to do specific things. So algorithms in social media are codes, and what they do is they actually, the people the, who are behind the, the screens who are coding all these very powerful instruments, they know how to put content per user. So the you the, the what i see on my social media is not going to look the same as every single person here and that's really dangerous if you think about it because first of all it curates content not always based on what you're looking at and what you're searching and what your what your interests are but sometimes based on arbitrary things for example like if i have a friend let's just i'm going to put a scenario out there you may not know this if i'm on instagram and i have a friend who really likes uh, to look up, um, I don't know, like, what is it? Cake recipes. cake recipes, good, that's a good example. Cake recipes, okay? If they're looking at cake recipes all day long, but I maybe I'm gluten-free and I couldn't care less about cake. I actually can't stand sweets. I love salty snacks, whatever the case is. All of a sudden, I'm gonna start seeing my feed filled with cake recipes because my friend is watching cake recipes. So algorithms can be so arbitrary that it's not, it's not designed to you know, give you content that you're interested in, but it actually can bring you content that someone else is interested in. So if you have friends that you don't, you know, and I know, because I have, I talk to youth all the time, but there are people who are on social media, and I mean, I, I have uh, teenagers who have 1,000, 2,000 plus friends. Uh, you guys, did you have 2,000 friends when you were in high school? <laughs> 
<laughs> I'm like, how do you know 2,000 people when you're 13? What is going on? There's something bizarre going on. That's not real. That's not reality. These are just friends of friends of friends of friends of friends of friends, and it just becomes this massive, uncontrolled thing. But then they are influencing the content you're, you're getting. So you don't even know what you're being influenced by, but just know for sure that there are, these are very powerful mediums, and they are obviously going to put content that they know will make you come back. Similar to um, casinos, right? Why are casinos places that we should definitely, as Muslims, not be supporting? What do casinos offer? Good, gambling, right? So what's why is gambling so exciting for people? What's the incentive of gambling? You can get a lot of money. Exactly. It's a false promise. Put in one coin, and what am I going to get? Potentially what? $2 exactly, $500. Maybe I can get a jackpot, $1,000. So there's a lure. There's a bait. It baits you into thinking if you do this small little action, you're going to get this massive return. And so they know what they're doing and in many ways with social media, they do the same thing. They lure you, it's bait, it's, it's designed to put something there that's gonna make you go, ooh, what's that? And then you follow the rabbit's hole and that's why, you know, um, Alice in the Wonderland is, is something that we, we use as a reference because once you go down that path, it's very hard to dig yourself back up and people become addicted. I've had parents, you know, reach out to me because their, their children, have really slipped into some dark places. They went down a dark demonic rabbit hole. So it's one thing to go down a rabbit hole of cake recipes. It's a whole other thing to start to see really evil, ha harmful things. Images that imprint into the brain and, and into the soul. You know, our teachers teach us that we have um, a spiritual eye. It's metaphorical, right? And that spiritual eye is uh, connected to the heart. And when you're looking at images that are haram, it's like basically stabbing that spiritual eye. It's, it's blinding the spiritual eye. And I've had people literally cry to me and say, I don't know what to do every time I pray. As soon as I go into prayer, I want to pray, but then Allah, like, I don't know how to control it. This image that I saw, it's a haram image, image comes to my mind the moment I go stand for prayer. So but there are people who are suffering real consequences of being affected by the, these poisonous darts that are being constantly, um, we're being bombarded with through social media. So the point of the film was to just bring that perspective that these are powerful, they're exciting, and they appear to be really good, but if you scale back and start to pay attention to how people are being influenced and the effects that it's having on the mental health of adults and youth alike, you will realize that they actually are harmful, unrestrained, like uh, uh, unrestricted. If you don't have rules, right? Um, and that's why the contract is a great idea. Has, does anybody have, have has anyone here ha um, had ha used a contract? Because some parents, mashallah, they're on their game. They've been looking into this stuff, they know. You have, a, you have a contract, awesome. Anybody else? Good for you guys, you guys have a contract. Why is a contract useful? Why is a contract, I mean, I've always, I always felt whether it's verbal or written, contracts between parents and youth can be useful, but why? Mm -hmm. Very good, to, to actually log or, or record the rules, right? Because sometimes, and parents, this is for you guys, I know because I've done this too, we're not consistent in our rules, right? How many times, one day when we're not in a good mood, absolutely not! You know, and then the next day, okay, honey, go watch that four hour, f you know, or you want to play video games for five hours. Okay, that's okay. Because we're in a good mood. We want a distraction. We got things to do. Do you know how confusing that is for these poor kids? They're like, what? She's mad at me today, but yesterday she's, she was fine. I don't know what's going on. So we, can't, we kind of can cause our problems because children need... As we know, those of us who are educators and those of us who are parents, we've learned over time, there's no manual, but we learn over time that children actually do really well when there are parameters set in place. When we communicate very clear boundaries, even if we th they think they're strict and they s may gripe a little bit, they benefit tremendously because it's consistency. 
when we're inconsistent is when we get into the back and forths and the constant bargaining and the argumentation because we're not consistent and we have to address that as adults. So the contract can take care of that, right? The contract actually keeps us accountable and it's respectful, that's why it works. Right, because you, and like I said, it can be verbal if, if you can be very clear in your agreement, or it can be written, but having some sort of a contract that you honor and that you allow your kids to actually think about and to reflect over and maybe even have some bargaining power is a really good way. And I'll tell you again, as, a, as an educator, I've always found that the best way to hold your kids accountable is with rules that they agreed with you upon, not just rules that you imposed on them. Because what you're doing is saying, these are your agreements, and I'm holding you accountable to your agreement. Like when we first you know, took out the phone and we, we decided what your rules were, you agreed to this, but now you're betraying that. That's much more effective than you saying, I told you not to do that, right? Because the child will then realize you're right, these were my words, and so I need to be responsible. So anyway, those are some tips. but. I think overall the film is really, uh, I mean, I, I, my opinion, but anyway, I'd love to you know, give you all the opportunity to share your reflections and thoughts. I just wanted to kind of give us some food for thought to really reflect about why uh, this film was made in the first place, some of the highlights about the, mo the film and the documentary, but any questions or reflections, any, um, any takeaways that you have from either the parents or the youth? We can give priority to the youth. Yes, assalamu alaikum. Just walk over with the mic for you. Just oh, raise sure. your hand, please. I think we had a hand right here. Yeah? Or was that your hand? <laughs> oh, yeah. Did Scratching you get that? Out. Yeah, right here. She there has it. There we go. <laughs> oh, uh, <laughs> so, uh, what would be your recommendation for screen time since school is off and for teenagers like 14, 13, 15 years old? So, mm. if, uh, in a day, I mean, how much they should be on screen? So, I mean, it really depends on your relationship with your child. Uh, you know, if you ask me in my home, I mean, I can share my rules with my kids. They know they have one hour every day. W even with the school off? Yes. Wow. One hour every day, and that's on controlled downtime on their devices. And they cannot, um, there's many of their apps that are not, that they're, because you can go into the settings, right? Especially if you have the iPhone, there's a lot of features there that allow you to control which apps that they can be on and which ones they can't. And so this is where parents have to be educated. You have to know the parent parental controls. You have to know the, the, the devices and how they give you permissions. So they have one hour every day and it's usually just to talk to their friends. Um, they don't play video games and you can ask them, they're here. Alhamdulillah, we're pretty consistent. And this has th been the case since they were very young. One hour of games a week on their iPads. And those have to be earned. So I'm very strict in this because I've done enough research to know how harmful these things are. And they have had a lot of discussions. And one of the points that one of the presenters made, which I 100% agree with, and I wish we could even play that clip again, that Parents fail their children when they don't articulate the reasons for the rules. We fail them. They have to understand that an hour more of these games or these medium will affect their brain. There's neuro, like, you know, there's neuroplasticity, we know, but their, their brains are being reshaped by these devices. They're very powerful. And then we talk about addiction. What is addiction? They, if, you don't, if you don't have a conversation with your children about things that, are addictive, have addictive properties and how they all are similar, then again, we're not, um, we're not explaining things to them with hikmah and our deen calls us to, to knowledge. It's not just you know, rule-based, it's actually wisdom, rules-based on wisdoms, right? So they know that beyond that, it would be excessive. There are times, you know, and uh, they know this, like <laughs> they've recently even asking me because last summer, I had a rule where I said to them, if I see that you're being like really productive, because we don't really we, we don't really stop s learning during the summer, and I don't, this is my personal advice, but I don't think children should stop ever learning. I don't think adults should stop learning. So the idea that summer school starts and then khalas, we stop learning, I don't think that's healthy. I think you should encourage your children to still 
preoccupy their brain. So give them alternatives to devices. If it's all games and all play, then they're going to want it. But when you still try to give them opportunities to learn, whether it's bringing them books that they're interested in or just any classes, there are much a lot of programs that you can sign them up for, then they'll keep them busy. So, But if they have been productive, then I will um, extend that to maybe an hour and a half. My uh, son, he's here, he has a smartphone, but there's no browser. I remove the browser from it. He cannot do any searches on that. It is, oh, yeah, you can do that. You can actually remove all the things that would lead them down to a path where they could be um, bombarded with something. So there's no browser. He has no searching capabilities. He can call, he can text, um, and he can you know, speak to like uh, on WhatsApp and those things, but no uh, social media and no browser. So there's ways to go around everything. And don't be, don't think that it's so binary, like it's, it's you have to give them or you have to restrict them. There's always the middle path. And we are the umma of the middle path, a balanced path. So I would say talk to your teenager and really try to figure out what is it that they need from this phone. Like the, you know, the girls, I don't know about the boys as much. How many boys, well, if you, if you feel like you want to disclose it, that's fine, but how many boys do you, either you're on or you know people that are on social media? Okay, so things have changed. If you, uh, if you did this survey, even during the film of five years ago, there was a clear um, difference between the usage between girls and boys. Boys were on video games more. They weren't as much on social media. Girls were more on social media. So I think you need to really dissect, like, what does your child need from the device? And then try to figure out a compromise that works with what's balanced for them. But that's just something that, um, that we've been able to do. Yes, did you, did you uh, have a question? Oh, oh, you're helping. OK, I'm sorry. All right, anyone else have a question? Yes, Assalamu alaikum. How are you? Alhamdulillah, great. All right, I'm so sorry, one second. Boys, I want to be able to hear our speakers, so can we all respectfully listen, please? That's, that's two times, by the way, I've addressed the boys, I have not addressed the girls. Just keep in score, keep in score. By the way, many of them are my students, so I can talk to them like that. Alhamdulillah. Go ahead. Alhamdulillah. Let's say you are a parent that has clear and consistent boundaries, but you have a child who is very tenacious and will ask you the same question and pushing the boundary over and over again similar to like yajuja majuj like <laughs> seriously like you know that it's not going to ever be a yes but they still ask the question yeah. how does a parent deal with that that's a great question and uh, i have one of those by the way <laughs> we i think we all get uh, one of those mashallah and that's from allah you know um, alhamdulillah T being tenacious is a gift uh, as well. So I think, you know, what I try to do with my kids is I always put it back on them because they can want forever and they can keep yearning and asking and asking, but I will always ask them, what did you do to earn it? Put it back on them, What's, where's the onus? And I think when you have that type of transactional view of social media, it becomes very clear for children that it's not a given, it's not an entitlement, it's not that because it's open I can just go get it. I have to earn it. And I'll tell you guys something, and I know this might be uh, recorded and maybe my, my family will see this, but it's okay, I'll admit this. So my children were gifted, um, what is it, what was it? What is it? A PS5, okay, they were gifted a PS5. They don't play video games other than like uh, Dream League Soccer or something like that. So I got this PS5 from one of my siblings, and I was like, okay. Not my world, but what do you do? You know, it's a gift. So alhamdulillah, we kept it, but I had a deal with them that I said, the way that you're going to get this PS5 is you have to clean the whole garage. The entire garage has to be cleaned, and we have to organize, and it's, it has to be like spotless. Like there was a lot of rules. How long ago did you get the PS5? Two years ago. <laughs> Two years ago. So every time they get, you know, sometimes teased by their cousins, what? You haven't opened the PS5? And I'll just go back to them like, I told them what they can do to earn it. Clearly, it's not worth it for them. So when you set up like you know, the 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 transaction, like you know, the rules of of how they can earn things, then again you hold them accountable. Like you clearly don't want it enough. 
If you wanted it enough, you'd be in that garage working every day, right? So until it becomes valuable enough for you for you to toil away and work hard for it, then don't come complaining to me. I'll see you, I'll, you'll see the PS5 when I see a garage that's clean. So I would say put it back on them and give them those guidelines of what they need to do to earn more. And if they earn it, then mashallah, that's, that's our deen too. You know, we can earn, you know, things even if they're not always the most ideal things, but I think we just have to be empowered parents and also empower our children. Because I don't, uh, this top down sort of, because I said so and there's no room for anything, uh, I don't agree with that either. I feel like we need to be better about negotiating, inshallah. Any questions from the brother side, the boys? You guys have a lot to say apparently. Hmm? Anything, anything to say? Okay, back here, alhamdulillah. Yes, yeah. oh, I'm sorry, yes. Okay. Oh, we do have, yes, salam alaikum. Oh, okay, sorry, we were looking at where. Salam alaikum. I just want to make one point, is that like, it seems that you give your kids to do something while they're not using their phones. So I, I'd like to make this as like something, an example for like parents, not to say that like, okay, we're gonna cut down your time to one, one hour, every single week, mm -hmm. but like they should be doing something instead, Absolutely. correct? Absolutely. So comparative to like being um, just on the phone, they could be doing like other curriculums for example, something 100%. you've been doing, right? Absolutely, you have to give them alternatives. Children, I mean, it's not their fault if, if you leave them unattended, bored, no, no, uh, unchallenged, there's nothing else to do. Then obviously the most instant, you know, uh, I mean, something that's in their hands that can give them instant gratification is going to appeal to them. But if you give them, um, again, alternatives, which, is, which could be uh, skills, which could be, you know, work around the home or l earning something, whatever that is, and you can talk to your kid to see what their interests are and try to figure out those ways, then um, it will help tremendously so that they're not, it's not boredom that's driving those decisions. Because most of the time, I think it is a lack of alternatives that makes kids just want the thing that's the most convenient and easy for them, right? Now, I saw your hands, sweetheart. Go ahead, yeah, mashallah. Sure. I mean, if you earned, you know, if you did really well in your studies and that's something that you negotiate with your parents, like if I get all straight A's, I make pr principles honor roll, can I get X, Y, and Z at the beginning of the school year? Yeah, your parents should honor that. But this is why the contract is important. Like you should make that stipulation at the beginning, at the onset, right? That, or if it's during a month, you know, if there's a particular month where you're gonna be really working on something, like if you participate in a science fair and you won the science fair or you placed, won first, second, third place, whatever it was, but it was part of the agreement that if I do this and I do it really well, can I get this outcome? And if that means playing video games, if that means, you know, getting a device, whatever that is, I think that's something that your each parent is gonna have to figure out. But I think that's uh, certainly, uh, something you can bargain with, inshallah. Yeah, sure. No, please. So the thing that, uh, that I fear most is that now I'm, I don't look at under a watch. Uh, um, I mean, uh, I can control. I can control my kids. Right. But what when they go to college and like in the documentary that kid he just went yeah. down. Uh, hit the bottom. So is there any um, suggestion to parents? I mean, how? C what What can we do about that, the time in college, sure. like uh, through our religion, or how can we reinforce them before they go to college and they don't just, just you know, fall down? Sure, no, Jazakallah khair, and it's an important point because obviously when they're not in our homes, like you said, we can't really uh, protect them as much, but hopefully, before we send them off to college, we've had enough conversations with them. We've shown them the data, we've shown them the research. And I think when you're using actual facts over just opinions, it's far more effective, right? If a child sees that you've done your homework as a parent, you know, I remember showing my kids when they were younger a documentary that actually showed 
the effects, it was showing brain scans of these devices on the brains and how it's actually causing damage, brain damage. They were like, oh my God. And they didn't want to watch TV and cartoons anymore because it, 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 they understood that mommy's not just arbitrarily saying don't do something. I'm actually coming from a place of concern. And I think this really speaks to the connection we have with our parents, I mean with our children. Pa children need to know that when we say no, it's not because we're being mean, it's not because we're being strict, it's literally because, and I always tell my kids, nobody on the planet will ever want your success and your protection more than me. So if I'm telling you not to do something, that's where it's coming from. This isn't about control. I'm not a tyrant. I don't care to control you. I care to protect you because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala put me in charge of doing that for you. So creating that bond is really important. And I think this goes really back to how are we parenting? So the, the, I mean, we can always impose rules, but if we don't have a clear uh, way, uh, culture in our home that where the child feels cared for and safe and that everything that, that, they're, that they're being asked to do or not to do is really for their protection, then that's where ground zero, that's where we need to start because that means that there's uh, a lack of connection. And, and then when they go off, they're probably going to be like, oh good, I'm out of here, I can go do whatever I want because they didn't feel connected, you know? And this is where people like Dr. Leonard Sachs I think is a really useful uh, resource. He really talks about the importance of creating healthy cultures in the home. Uh, you know, I've alhamdulillah done panels with him and he told me flat out, and these, this is an American board certified physician and psychologist. He's an expert. He's one of the leading experts. He works a lot, thousands of patients with youth. But he told me flat out, he said, please go back to the Muslim community and tell them whatever they're doing in terms of their cultures like they're, whether they're from you know, Pakistan, Egypt, Afghanistan, Palestine, whatever culture practices you have, religious practices you have, please do not let those go because he said American culture is toxic. Cre preserve the, the cultural uh, you know, foundations of your uh, religion or faith or your cultures and make sure that your home environment is reflective of that. And so if we do that, you know, especially when they're younger and we consistently do that throughout their teen years where they really feel connected with us, then by the time they go off to college, hopefully, and this is a, at the end of the day, outcomes are by Allah. So I always tell parents, we just, we, we do our work, we do our job, we put our trust in Allah, we make our dua, we put our best effort forward, but they are at the end of the day accountable to their creator. And if we've given them that conscience, you know, that, that uh, awareness, and hopefully they'll be able to make the right decisions, inshallah. Yes, of course. Oh, you know what? It was like a, I have to look for it, but I think it was CBS News. I do remember it was CBS News did a whole special. Um, I could probably find it. I could probably find it. Yeah, maybe we can put it on the link of this talk, inshallah. Yeah, so once I find it, I'll put it on the link, okay? Yeah, of course. Yes, Manara, again. <laughs> Alhamdulillah. So let's say that we are able to balance schoolwork and fun stuff for our kids and they're not on screens, but how do we instill that love and connection with the deen and with the masjid? Let's say you have a child who's very resistant mm -hmm. to like going to the masjid, for example. Yeah, no, that's a good question. And I do encounter this a lot. Alhamdulillah, I think we're, first of all, we have to acknowledge that we're in a community, mashallah, that's very lively and it has a lot of you know, programs tailored for youth and they do their best. It, this is an exception to the rule. There are a lot of communities in Massachusetts that simply don't have the, the, the level of and the degree of programming that we have, which is always a huge blessing. And sometimes though, that can be kind of like a catch-22 because you know, if it's overload and there's a lot of offerings and people kind of are like, ah, I'll just catch it next time. And so you start to take it for granted. But I think there is ample opportunity in the Bay Area to try to find programs that speak to your particular child's interests. Because sometimes it's not really, you know, if, if it's if it's the speaker, it could be the speaker, it could be the subject matter. So you want to really hone in on what uh, topics interest your child that are connected to the dean. And uh, we also have to get out of, I think, this is my personal opinion, of a very black and white interpretation of what is religious studies because, you know, children need to under, you know, to be brought into um, and, and 
into the dean through through different avenues. You know, there's the there's the artistic uh, child that that could benefit maybe from a calligraphy class. That's still learning. You know, the beauty of uh, or geometric design. You're still teaching them Islam through something that also appeals to them. Then there's others that are more physical. You know, they're more kinetic, and maybe they need uh, to be in something that focuses on grappling, archery, horseback riding. You can teach Dean through other means instead of just sitting and it's Islamic studies and Quran and Hadith, all of that can be infused, right? So I think when we start to really become more creative with the way that we're teaching Dean to our children and looking at their interests and tailoring their uh, instruction, um, then we can find those programs. And then the last thing I'll say on that is, if your child is reluctant to come to the masjid, um, I would advise and I have advised parents to please consider doing home halaqas with a small group. Islam started, right? with a small group that were meeting in Dar al-Alqam, right? And they were meeting, they were learning, the Prophet was giving them the seeds, but it was private home halaqas, and I really think that in this time of fitna, in this time of oversaturated information, um, it's everything so diluted that we can really provide deep heart-to-heart -heart connections by bringing instructors to our home, allowing our children to thrive in spaces that they feel comfortable in. And if you think of, of a child who is in a, in a time and day and age where anxiety disorders are through the roof among youth, we can scale back a lot of that anxiety when we put the, it's they're in their own domain, right? In their home, they're in their domain. When you go outside of the home, it's anxious. So that's why they don't want to go. But when they're calling the shots and people are coming to their home, you feel a, a level of confidence that can really help bolster the child's interest. And then just providing them with a solid um, mentor or teacher. And hopefully, inshallah, I think um, we're, we're working on the programming now with Brother Munir. But in a couple of months, we're going to be uh, doing some programs around the importance of mentorship. And we're, I'm really excited for that. And you guys, please, if you see that topic, come, because it's going to open your eyes to the immense benefit of finding mentors for your children. We all have to do it. I have to do it. You have to do it. When they reach a certain age, we have to pass the baton. You know, We teach them right up until a certain point, but children, I could speak verbatim to my child, and another person could say, uh, I mean, say what I said verbatim, they'll hear it from them <laughs> more than me. And that's just, we have to you know, accept that as parents, that we lose some some of that effectivity, and but we do have, alhamdulillah, people in, in our midst that can uh, step into that role, inshallah. So look for those mentors, alhamdulillah. Assalamu alaikum. <laughs> alhamdulillah, any other comments or questions? I would love to hear, yes, Sultan. Yes, assalamu alaikum. Yes, these are my lovely students, so mashallah. Yes. As a kid, how should we like pull ourselves away from electronics? like without the help of our parent? Excellent, I think that's a really good question. Thank you, Sultan, because self-restraint, and you guys know, these are my Islamic stu studies uh, students, so they know we've talked a lot about Imam al-Ghazali's teachings, right? What do we talk about? What are the three parts of the human being? What are they? Good, I know that the parents are like, what, dog, pig, what, what is this? <laughs> what are you teaching them? I know, Imam al-Ghazali talks about the different impulses, right? The, what we call the quwa, the quwat al-ghadabiyya, the quwat al-shahwaniyya, the quwat al-aqliyya. There's three components of the human being. There's the intellect, intellectual capacity, we have the emotional capacity, and we have the appetitive. So we teach our students that if your intellect is not controlling you, then the other two are. And that's either your appetites or your emotions. We live in a day and age where the powers that be, the people who are creating these devices, and by the way, you should know this, all of these tech giants, Elon Musk, even Steve Jobs, all of them, Bill Gates, all of these people who created these devices that we're all hooked on, many of them refused to give their children devices because they knew decades ago how powerful and addictive these things were. So they actually did not give their children devices. It's documented, it's well known. So why? Because they understood that we have these appetitive impulse control problems and so being aware of that is the first step, right? Being aware that we have addictive parts of our brain, that if you, um, you know, that if you give, uh, like social media, they say, is some of it is, so, is, is, is more addictive than crack cocaine on the brain. When you're getting those likes, those notifications, the, the way that it affects your brain is even more potent than a hit of cocaine, a shot through the nose. 
That is that should alarm us. It should terrify us. But what it should do is put us back into a what intellectual, rational state of mind that says, this is why Allah Subhanahu wa Taala, you know, instructs us as human beings to live regimented lives. Right? What's our top priority? What are we supposed to do? Why were we created? Why did Allah Subhanahu wa create human beings and jinn? For what reason? For what reason? To worship him. That is the number one reason why we are here. We pray five times a day spread out because Allah wants us to be people of what? Discipline, people of order, people of restraint. We fast during the month of Ramadan. Why? Because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wants us to hold back our appetites, to not give in to every desire and craving and constantly gorge ourselves to death. So there is a, a message, a theme very consistent in our tradition that talks about the importance of being people of balance and restraint. So how do you control yourself? You should recognize that the, as soon as you start to just feel like, what am I doing with my time, right? If I'm spending 30 minutes on a game and then it's an hour and, and I say this, I've said this to my students. There was a, quickly, a documentary, I think, out of South Korea or North Korea, where they were so addicted to video games that some of these people, they had like these massive spaces that they would just come together to play games on. They were so addictive. They got to the point that there was, they were so addicted that they started wearing adult diapers because they wanted, they couldn't leave the screen to go use the restroom. Do you want to ever, God forbid, be in a position where something has such power over you that you would rather defecate in your own self, I mean, on yourself, than to get up to use the restroom because God forbid you separate yourself from the device? To me, that kind of stuff is terrifying. But this wasn't one person, you guys. This was like a whole, you know how they have like internet cafes? Th this was a whole building full of people who were that addicted. So we have to recognize Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala teaches us we're weak. He created us weak. And we have certain things that make us weak. And these devices um, and, and the science behind them are designed to be addictive. So you have to have the knowledge and the intellect. And I, I say this, you're, you know, many of you are you know, in your teens. By the Islamic standard, you are adults in Sharia. Did you know that? When you reach teenage, the age of bulugh, the age of, of uh, you know, adolescence, by Sharia Islamia, you are considered an adult because your rational mind works just as effectively. You can understand information just the same way the adult does. This culture infantilizes children and it's to the detriment of children because it teaches children that, oh, you're just a kid, you can do it. It's okay, let them, let them, they're just kids. No, they are not. There were, you know, Sayyidina Ali, how old was he when he became uh, a Muslim, when he took a shahada? He was 10 years old. We have many of the early sahab sahabas were in their, you know, pre-adolescent age, and they were teaching, they were guiding, they were, they were huge pillars of our faith. There were teenage boys leading battles. So we have got to do a better job as parents of not accepting the Western standard that children are children and we just infantilize them and treat them like kids and it's okay, it's okay. No, 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 no. Hold them accountable to adult standards and say, you know what, you know that this is harmful to you. You know, just check in to yourself, your own understanding. You read the research, here's the research, here's the documentary, you saw it for yourself. Is this good for you? And if, if we start to speak to our children um, like that and hold them to a higher standard, inshallah they'll respond. I think it's, it's the opposite that's caused a lot of problems. Alhamdulillah. Yes. Oh, yes. Please. Assalamu alaikum wa alaikum assalam. I wanted to thank you so much, Ustada Hosai, coming last minute. Thank you. May Allah bless you and your family and reward you immensely. Um, my quick question was. Uh, what do you say to teens who say, well, we need to learn anyways? Like, why not learn? The sooner we learn, the better. Okay. Or parents even have that sentiment Yeah, sometimes. no, that's a very good question. And I know that, again, because we live in a time where 
Um, on the one hand, as I just said, children are infantilized and treated like they are too dumb to understand concepts, but on the other side, they're exploited and pushed into adult behavior very early. So it's really schizophrenic the way this culture treats children. So kids pick up on the, these little you know, sentiments, these notions, and they wanna be suddenly like little mini adults. Well, this is where we go back to our deen, right? And there's a time and age for everything. And when you're in fitra, what's fitra? What does fitra mean? What does it mean to be in fitra? There is an innocence, sure. It's a, it's a state of purity, it's a state of innocence, it's the natural state of the human being that children are in. When we're in fitra, and then we graduate into adolescence and then eventually adulthood, we're kind of coming out of that state, right? We're awakening to the evils of the world, we're awakening to a lot of things, but it's a gradual process. And so I would say to any child that thinks like, well, we might as well learn it, the earlier the better, don't force yourself out of a natural state of fitra. It's, it's, it, it, we're seeing the effects of that. Because children aren't allowed to be children in their innocence, not in their intellectual capacities, in their innocence, we have a lot of problems in this culture. We have um, everything from unwanted you know, pregnancies to uh, spread of disease. We have a lot of, you know, all these things that we talked about, social ills, addictive behaviors. A lot of that comes from children forcing themselves out, running out of childhood into adulthood. And pace yourself. There's a time and place for everything. Let yourself experience the world in a natural, organic way. And do not take your cues on, on behavior based on this culture, please. This culture, the proof is, is evident. It's evident by looking at it. Is this really something you want to model? Or do you want to model a deen that Allah subhanahu wa has perfected? The Prophet sallallahu who is a perfect example. We have perfection. Why would we take a substandard view of how to raise ourselves, or I mean ra raise our children or our family, when we have the perfect deen of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? So I feel like we really need to remind ourselves to not you know, go take the cheaper alternative, the lower alternative, and, 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 uh, and lower our standards based on what's popular, what's trending, what our classmates are saying in schools, what celebrities are saying. No, they're not, these are not role models for us. We have the perfect role model. And in our faith, uh, fitra is something we should extend. It's something that we hope to have even into adulthood not to throw it out. So learning things and emerging from childhood um, because you, want it, you think it's better to learn uh, earlier the better, that's just um, a very Western attitude and it's not our, our tradition. Okay, alhamdulillah. Okay, uh, sorry, last question, inshallah, one more? Yeah, okay, we'll take one more question because I think the other went on, right? Okay, so go ahead, Amani. Yes. Mashallah, sweet. It's, she's giving her turn to anyone else who may have a question if you do. Otherwise, go for it, sweetheart. Yes. Very good question. I think it really depends on uh, the intention, right? Innamal is a principle of our faith. What are you doing on social media? If your niya is there, like there are influencers who are doing incredible things. They're putting content out there that is changing lives. It's impactful. They're actually producing really good content. If that's your niya, Allahu Akbar, may Allah give you tawfiq. But if your niya on social media is to watch, to, to just stare at things, to look at things, to consume, to consume, consume, it's basically like standing in front of the fridge and just gorging with your mind. That's what you're doing. You can't make a case for it. What are you doing up at night? At, and, and there's kids who are, their devices, and if you have children and you let them have their devices with them in their bedrooms, please, for the love of God, that is a rule like even the most secular people know. So we should certainly know that. Uh, who don't have morals like and values the way we do, uh, traditional values. They do not give their children these things into, the, into their bedrooms. So please make sure that you're, you're not doing that. But staying up until two o'clock in the morning scrolling through TikTok is literally like standing in front of the fridge. Just, ah! What are you doing? Why are you consuming at that hour? Go to bed. <laughs> right, go to bed. So we need to bring back balance, we need to bring back restraint, we need to teach our kids the harms of these things. But the most important thing, and I hope this is the takeaway that you take, get to know your children, speak to them, find out what their interests are. It's sports, it's academics, it's art, it's intellectual pursuits. Give them alternatives 
inshallah, when they have ample alternatives, they won't feel so dependent on these devices. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala reward each and every one of you. Jazakumullah khair and iqamat as salam. Jazakallah khair. Real quick, I want to mention after your prayer, we have ice cream for everybody uh, outside in the lobby, and we also have a free game. I think it's called uh, We're Not Strangers that you can take home to reduce uh, screen, screen time. So pick up one of those games, inshallah, too. It's all complimentary. Thank you for coming out for family night. Jazakallah khair, Ustada. May Allah bless you. Assalamu alaikum. I'm